Hello, I am Gabriel Bronner, and this is the Big Compute Podcast. Today's topic is rethinking HPC in academia. Traditionally, HPC in academia has been on-premise. A system acquired by the institution is kept for five years. Utilization is high, so user jobs wait in queues, and relative performance declines over time. With the advent of HPC cloud platforms, we wonder if it's time to rethink HPC for academia. Instead of one institution, one system, we enable access to systems on-premise, across multiple centers, and in the cloud. At the same level of spending, we may be able to accelerate time to science and enable new areas of research by having access to multiple architectures, to the latest technologies, and by reducing time waiting in queues. To discuss HPC in academia, our guest today is Marek Michalevich. Marek is the director of ICM, the High Performance Computing Center at the University of Warsaw. With many years in the industry, Marek has headed uh, academic and research HPC centers, including ASTAR Computational Research Center in Singapore. Welcome, Marek, to the Big Compute Podcast. Uh, good morning, Gabriel. It's morning in Warsaw. It's uh, nighttime at your place. Uh, great to talk to you. I'm uh, very happy to answer your questions and to share some of my thinking on uh, HPC in cloud or, or the progression of uh, academic HPC computing. Marek, it's fantastic to have you here uh, with your experience. So I look forward to having this conversation with you. Maybe we can start from the beginning. What are your views on, on HPC in academia today? And what are the challenges we face? And maybe since you're in Warsaw in the cold morning, we can start with the University of Warsaw and how you see things from there. Well, I, uh, there, are, there are numerous uh, challenges uh, in, the, in the environment that, uh, that are typical envi academic environment in Poland or other country. And one, one of the uh, two biggest challenges is on one hand, there is an uh, appetite, for appetite and, and the requirements for, for computing and for storage. It sometimes separate storage from computing. And on the other hand, the, the funding cycle is not predictable. So it's very difficult to do long-term plans for expansion, for maintaining the quality of service when very often the sources of funding are ill-defined and, and varied. Sometimes they come from within the university, sometimes from, from various ministries and bodies of the sometimes from external grants uh, in in our case uh, european union grants but uh, and they are they, they are substantial of course and they help us uh, uh, meet those needs that we 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 are uh, charged to, to to satisfy but but the planning is a very big thing and and uh, of course in our industry the uh, very it's very difficult to predict expansion so for example around me i see incredible uh, explosion of interest in quantum computing a uh, very new thing it's it's uh, fueled by curiosity and excitement uh, among young people and of course uh, there are no uh, readily available hardware or uh, resources uh, to 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 let young people explore and experiment with this. And it would be absolutely fantastic if a uh, great variety of uh, modalities, different uh, possible computing platforms uh, was av available for, uh, for young people, for researchers, academics. This is great to hear. So on the one hand, there's challenges like funding. When are you gonna get money? On the other hand, there's the possibilities of interest in quantum computing and how are you going to access so challenges and opportunities at the same time. Can you tell me a bit more about the funding situation? So is it typical for universities to get funding cycles or is it grants that different uh, research projects are going to receive or how, do you, how are you going to receive money or is it very unpredictable for you? Um, 
it's not entirely unpredictable because uh, in the in case of of a center like mine icm uh, we are funded and there are five uh, high performance computing academic centers in poland they are all sort of on an equal league uh, each one has got the really brand new data centers and about the uh, of the order of petaflop computing uh, uh, engine each each one of, of them so and the funding is provided through three-year cycle funding from Ministry of Science and Higher Education. So it goes directly from the ministry. However, over the last three years, this, this funding was not sufficient. Uh, we experienced, we actually enjoyed a very fast uh, development cycle. Uh, about four or five years ago, uh, Poland was uh, extremely fortunate to receive larger funding from European Union that allowed us to expand in the, in the unprecedented way. But with the very fast growth comes uh, the period of sort of uh, unmet uh, ongoing needs. So operationally, uh, of all five uh, centers suffered. And they, of course, uh, deal with, with that uh, problem in different ways. So one center is extremely um, renowned and, and, and active in the networking. So, of course, they, they, they can manage somehow uh, if, if, with, with different source of income. But others were not so fortunate. So it was a, a period of, of difficult three years. Right now, we are at the verge of, of a new three-year uh, funding period. We'll see how it will go. But I, I believe that the, this is uh, typical, not only of Poland, but other countries too. Of course, there is a very interesting, uh, there are interesting mechanisms of funding at the, the European Union level. And right now, we are at the verge of uh, embarking on the Euro HPC program. But of course, the Euro HPC will, will provide in a few years' time incredibly large resources. Uh, but uh, some of those resources, I believe, will be more appropriate for. for for extremely seasoned users. And uh, I always care about uh, this group of uh, uh, sort of uh, newcomers. You know, so I think we, we have to really think always in, in an academic environment of, of that specific group of people who have not tried HPC yet. And for, for, for that group, uh, there are special needs. They don't necessarily need to have a scale but definitely they have to have a feel of, of how, how it is to use uh, uh, resources that can expand sort of uh, practically without limit. Uh, that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, I think when you talk about the newcomers, it's fantastic that you're thinking about them. Many people coming into HPC, but without the 20 plus years of experience. And I assume you, those are the people you want to be bringing along, growing the community, educating. Um, are you seeing growth in the people who have not used HPC before coming to HPC today? Look, I, I see it because I want to see it. And, uh, and actually, mm -hmm. I'm also actively looking for, for people who, who have not uh, experienced HPC. And one of the, that's one of the reasons we have started uh, training students for student cluster competition, uh, which is a fantastic kind of event uh, run at uh, SC and ISC in Germany and also in China by uh, ASC organization. I started the student team in Singapore. They are extremely successful to the extent that after a few years they have won the competition in America at SC last year. That was two years ago. It was absolutely brilliant. And, and now when I moved to Warsaw, I started the Warsaw team and the, this year they will go to their sixth final at the competition. So now I have two teams that I started at various competitions competing against each other. Great to see. And those people come to, to HPC uh, not knowing anything. Of course, they are brilliant. They're very, very talented young people. And it, 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 Gabriel, I tell you, it's, it's, it's great fun to, to see people who come. They, they are curious. They have, uh, they have bright minds. And suddenly they get excited in HPC. But that's just, you know, that's very select. You know, they are the sort of uh, 
almost, you know, they become almost professional after a few years of training. But if, what I'm thinking is that right now we have on the order of 1,000 registered users on our HPC systems and some sort of semi-grid systems. Uh, and uh, within university, we have 50,000 students of the order of 50,000. It's the largest university in Poland. And I don't see any reason why almost anybody at the university should not have access to expandable resources. When I say it's uh, the resources that can go from, from one core to thousands of cores or tens, tens of thousands of cores or more, depending on the needs, and uh, almost everybody has, has some, some uh, right nowadays, everybody has computing needs. And I think university could provide that, not necessarily through own resources. Because we know, of, of course, that lots of academics and students already use uh, various uh, commercial clouds. Yeah. So you'd like to see not a thousand users, but 50,000 users Absolutely, using high yeah. performance computing. This is a well, fantastic goal, fantastic vision. It's great. Gabriel, uh, I would like to completely, completely obliterate, remove the obstacles uh, to, uh, to, uh, to access to computing resources. And, and when I say computing resources of any scale, of course, the, the, requirement has to be justified uh, but uh, entry should not be uh, s uh, difficult yeah now this idea of democratizing access to everyone is is great to hear i like to i like your vision i'm, I'm rediscovering the world by listening to you and your students and Congratulations to the progress they make in and look forward to get to the 50 students uh, and let's make it happen. Let me ask you, you said a bit earlier, um, um, there's five centers in Poland. Can you tell us a bit more? We, we're not always in Poland and, and we don't know. Are these five centers different in terms of specialization? Are they similar? Um, each of them focus in a different area or how does it work? Uh, they are different. Uh, first of all, slight uh, sort of uh, correction. There are five centers that are directly funded through Ministry of Science and Higher Education. There is a sixth center, which, which is uh, slightly offside, but uh, of course belongs to the same category. That's uh, the Center of uh, National Nuclear Research uh, Institute. And of course, that, that center is, is mostly focused on, on nuclear research. They run nuclear reactor. They are very closely connected with various, uh, very large scale European experiments. So that is very focused facility. Of course, there is there are there are very good there's there's very good equipment there. Facility is great. It's not very far from Warsaw, and we collaborate with them. There are five uh, centers, uh, and they more or less uh, uh, became their operation at about the same time. About 25 years ago, it all started. Uh, my center is, is in Warsaw. It's uh, connected to, it's part of University of Warsaw. And we traditionally were uh, focused on uh, very large scale computations, more of a, a capability type. With, and, and traditionally we had very interesting uh, computing equipment. There was cell computer at one stage, uh, Blue Gene P, Blue Gene Q, Power Seven machine, water cooled. So, some some really really interesting and uh, more exotic type of computers. Whereas uh, other centers, especially uh, the two major ones, are Cifronet in Krakow, uh, related to Academy of uh, Mining and a very highly regarded school. Uh, they actually operate the largest supercomputing uh, equipment right now of the order of two and a half, close to three petaflops. Uh, incidentally, it's a HP system, liquid cooled, Apollo kind. And uh, we also have a Poznan supercomputing and networking center. That center is, is uh, our leader in networking. So of course they have a very substantial, very equal to ours computing uh, capacity. They, uh, they, they also uh, focus more on capacity and uh, it's a cluster system, Fed tree connected. For example, our system is Cray XC40. So it's RES uh, 
it's again different than most other centers in Poland. So in terms of equipment, we differentiate slightly. Uh, going back to Poznan, Poznan, uh, one of the most um, brilliant thing they have uh, done, and they are they were the leaders of this initiative in Poland about ten years or more ago. They started a project called Pioneer, and they have built optical network, academic optical network that is fully owned by by this organization, Pioneer. It's shared by uh, all the metropolitan centers and HPC centers. So now in Poland, we have seven and a half thousand uh, kilometers of optical fiber, and we don't have to pay uh, commercial carriers for that. Mm. Allows us also to do all sorts of experiments and tests. And uh, in, in sense of networking, we, we really uh, are the world leaders. And this is, of course, due to the work of predominantly Poznań Supercomputing and Networking Center with whom, of course, uh, ICN collaborates very closely. So, Marek, know, you're, yeah, you're yes. very familiar with, uh, with these different centers and the capabilities they have. So I think it's a great segue onto the question I, I also wanted to ask you, which is uh, how do you view uh, the possibilities of assuming all these centers become a pool for us to use? So if I'm a user, I'm not just a user at the Warsaw Center, but I'm a user of this community. And when I submit jobs, the jobs are gonna run on the, on the best place to run a job. So we, we move from one system, one center to, now I have access to all the system, I have access to a variety of architectures, I have access to systems that may have lower waiting queue than other systems, me as a user benefit from that variety. If I'm an academic, I'm a researcher, I get the advantage of the multiple architectures and the new architectures or even the reduced waiting queue. How do you see that as a possibility? What are your views on that? Gabriel, actually, we are sort of going directly into so cloud, HPC cloud solutions. But the interesting thing is that is, Sometimes very difficult to be original. And in a sense, here, we are not original. What, what we are talking here is about, in a certain sense, refresh of the technology, expansion of something that has already existed. Because one of the very, very neat things that they have introduced in Poland is, uh, is a solution called GRID.pl. And actually, GRID.pl was, was driven by another center, by the Cifronet Center, and uh, that, that's their huge uh, achievement. And of course, we are part of it. So basically, we uh, did have it, but it was not as scalable and not as flexible as uh, what you can achieve with cloud solutions. Because Grid, GridPL was, in a certain sense, something like Exceed program in America, or you know, a predecessor of Exceed. But of course, it's not based on, on the, it's rather rigid. It's basically a grid system with own solutions. And, and some users, large group of users in Poland, academic users, were already using uh, resources from, from various centers. And this one, we have one or two very substantial clusters that were explicitly or so exclusively reserved for this grid PL work. And they were actually acquired through special funding from, from this uh, very, very large project. This project has been going on for three years, for three rounds, it was uh, th three stages of grid PEL, PEL uh, grid uh, project. And, uh, but what I see is that, that this moving into much more sophisticated and flexible and uh, technology that is allowed now through uh, cloud, HPC cloud solutions, and provisioning is, is very natural progression, a very natural step. I can't see a way out of it. If okay, we've already yes. Yeah, that sounds very interesting because uh, we could say that grid uh, has existed for some time, yeah. is not uh, you know massively adopted today. The concept has existed. Um, you're seeing positives now with HPC cloud platforms. Uh, are there any elements of that that you think make it more attractive than the way we used to approach greed in the last 10 years or something like that? Are you seeing 
some aspects of that that you particularly like? I'm curious. Well, I, uh, I, I always saw advantages of, of grid computing. And actually, all of those things, when I look back uh, into how they develop, they, they very natural progress, uh, progression. And I remember back in the 90s when I was in uh, Canberra, one of my uh, pals, uh, Russ Standish at ANU, he was using cycle harvesting from all sorts of resources at the university. And the, then we had this uh, Condor solution and similar solutions. So there were, there were solutions that were sort of uh, addressing the problem of wasting of resources extremely huge waste of, of computing resources. Then we had this progression to uh, things like grid. You, you see it uh, in, in places like uh, Poland with the Pell grid solution, but they, they, are, they are very rigid. You know, there, there's um, still configuration of the system is, is different. So we had to wait for, for time where certain technical and business solutions uh, had to be found. And, and I give a few examples. First thing, in the context of HPC is provisioning of topology and network. That was not possible, and you couldn't, couldn't do it in an easy way. Nowadays, you can do it. Uh, then you have to have things like, uh, in order to merge those things, you have to have uh, interplay between uh, cloud provisioning and uh, batch provisioning, queuing systems uh, and uh, schedulers. If you can uh, merge them so you can actually mix interactive and batch processing. And one of the fantastic, and uh, of course grid was also batch processing. So it, it had this, uh, these features of H typical HPC environment and, and rather rigid. Whereas with cloud, you can, we can actually treat supercomputing as your desktop and and uh, moving from batch to interactive i think it, it's it, it makes huge difference then yeah, there, are, there are other other very important things that you can nowadays with the development of containers dockers and singularity and, and whatnot you, you can actually package your not only your program not only your problem but the whole environment and then you touch into two most important things that I think are, are also emerging, of course, it's very well recognized for, for forever, which is correctness and reproducibility. Because of course, you need to run it on the system that is stable, but you also have to understand that your results are correct and you can repeat them. And you cannot repeat them at different pieces of hardware, but also at different uh, time, uh, time points. Uh, so after a few years, you can re re go back to your computations and have, have uh, similar results. Now, so uh, next uh, aspect that was a little bit sort of uh, causing uh, difficulty was data movement. Uh, but nowadays, if, if that, is, that is also the, the, uh, this obstacle is being removed. And you have various context, concepts like uh, in memory computing. And of course, you, you also have a huge pipelines. And you can move. And also, with, with the, with the, uh, if you make a computing resource ubiquitous, then, then actually it doesn't really matter where you compute you actually should move your compute, uh, compute part to where your data is. And if, if there is a proliferation, or there's a widely accepted uh, cloud store solution, it doesn't really matter where you compute. Then, then again, that, uh, that will lead to reduction of costs. So all those, uh, those things uh, lead me to, to, to think that uh, there's absolutely no way out of, of these things. So, so, so people have been talking for, for a long time about utility, com computing as utility. And you see it's happening. And then I, I have to really congratulate people from, uh, from uh, who started Uber Cloud, for example. Uber Cloud has, has just got some accolades and then uh, was recognized. And you see other things in business, in industry, for example, the, the thing that the uh, uh, the fact that IBM has acquired Red Hat is uh, interpreted by many analysts as uh, the move 
to, to cloud and the provision of the salt. And then you, ha you will see convergence and you already see it that, that commercial enterprise uh, kind uh, of cloud providers are slowly moving and encroaching to HPC territory. So suddenly you can, you can have craze available as, as uh, cloud uh, instances or FPGAs or GPU uh, enabled uh, hardware as uh, cloud hardware. So, and that, that's actually a perfect. That's ex exactly what should be happening. The, the merging of the worlds. No, this, this sounds like, I, I like your thinking. I like how you go from, you know, we were always trying to get there, like grid was trying to get there, but maybe it wasn't as flexible. With the advent of cloud, now we have more flexibility to enable this pool of systems to be together. And in addition, you have this variety of architecture you can take advantage of. So I think is we always wanted to do this, but it's getting much, much closer with the cloud platforms being developed today. So I think uh, your vision is one that maybe you see it happening and you've been seeing it happening for a while. It's materializing slowly. The question I would ask you now is, uh, what challenges do you see in terms of this transformation for HPC in academia? Is everybody with you or are you fighting this battle a bit uh, in a lonely way? I'm kind of curious. Uh, not lonely. I, there is a battle for sure and there, there will be battle. And, and I think the, the main obstacle, there are various kinds of obstacles. One is, is the psychology, human factor. Because, uh, and, and people are actually very afraid of losing control and losing their own territory. And I've seen it for, uh, you know, when I worked in, in Singapore, my colleagues, excellent uh, technical people, were so skeptical and critical uh, about cloud. Of course, the, the, the time was different. That was about 10 years ago. And surely there was no f f f certain pieces of solution like provision of interconnect in, the, in, the, in Finiband, for example. But now uh, those those technical obstacles are, are, are being conquered. They're not, not, not they are not a problem anymore. But people are always constantly, uh, you know, afraid of of losing their sort of uh, special position or you know, their expertise. But I, I never worry about it because uh, whatever way you provision resources, you still need to have expertise to guide users. And there will be hordes of new users. So I think it will be. If it boom, you know, it will be excellent uh, time for us to 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 offer our expertise. It's 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 not it's not threatening at all for me. Uh, of course, there are other things like um, the way of thinking. The uh, people who who live in the enterprise or sort of commodity type of environment. They don't necessarily understand, fully understand, are not attuned to, to the specific needs of HPC and supercomputing. And uh, so, so there's a, when you merge those two words, words uh, people might not fully understand. They, are, they will, they, of course, they're very smart people on both sides, but uh, there, there will be some differences. And, uh, if, and, and I can give you an example, for example, in, in, in many, places you have certain resources available as cloud at various universities but usually those resources are managed administered by different group of people who come from from this uh, commodity world uh, way of thinking and when 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 we start talking you know they also afraid that we would be encroaching on their territory because basically it is about removing the barriers but for me, those barriers are for users, not for operators. So, of course, you know, the, the difficulty is on the side of, of those who manage, those who get funding, those who decide about what kind of resources uh, should be acquired or merged or uh, accessible. And, and so, so the, the, the greatest factor is always uh, human psychology, not technology, not hardware. Uh, not uh, space and uh, nothing else. Of course, money too. 
Yeah, of course. <laughs> There's always money in the equation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Marek, I'm, I'm left with this uh, great uh, impression of your vision, which is we are moving to this new world where cloud technology and cloud platforms are going to enable this uh, merging or this uh, ability to use multiple systems across academic institutions, to use multiple architectures that they become available, uh, whatever they are. Uh, we always try to do this is uh, previous times we try with grid, but it wasn't as flexible. It's happening now. And maybe because it's happening, it represents change. And some people are seeing this like uh, encroaching in their territory. Uh, but that will happen and people find new ways of work of that. And we'll all benefit from the changes coming along. So it's, it's great to hear uh, your thinking in the process and try to learn as I, as, as I hear this. Uh, before we close, I, I'd like to ask anything you'd like to add to this. Well, I think, I think just two, two, uh, two extra things that, the, that I was thinking and, and when collecting my thoughts before our, our uh, discussion. There are two things. One is, is uh, this uh, human in the loop uh, thing that really interests me and uh, things that are related, uh, uh, that is uh, interactive programming and visualization and also ability to test arbitrary kind of uh, hardware that, uh, that might be very rare or very expensive or, or of, uh, exotic. And with cloud and with, with sort of globally distributed uh, resources, incidentally, we have, we have been working on this globally distributed resources uh, by building InfiniCortex projects, project for, for three years in 2014 to 2016 with about 40 to 50 different organizations in the world. So, so that, that was moving into that, into sort of uh, making, basically breaking down all the, all the barrier, barriers of distance, country borders and the uh, divisions between uh, you know continents you know, if if you sort of merge it you can build uh, one huge humongous resource that can be chopped in different ways it could be sometimes it could be used as one single humongous uh, computer of unprecedented scales uh, on, on the other hand it can be used by by great number of people for smaller tasks because not not every task and a very, very interesting scientific problem, academic problem, it doesn't have to be huge in size. So I would like to very much thank our guest, Marek Michalevich, director of ICM, the High Performance Computing Center at the University of Warsaw, for sharing his experience and his vision to help us understand the future of HPC in academia. Till next time, I'm Gabriel Bronner, and this was the Big Compute Podcast. Mm -hmm.